Right, good evening. So what did we talk about last time? Bubble sort. Arrays. Don't forget arrays part and bubble sort. And bubble sort is to, to, to show how you deal with data structures like arrays, which you saw. Any question on arrays and bubble sort? No, really? Well, I mean, I'm sure all of us have a million <laughs> that was nowhere near as easy to make it sound. So how do you index into an element? Phil? How do I index an array? Yes. Or? Let's say I want give me the fourth element. How would you do it? What's the fourth element? Just get me the data on the fourth element. Like how did you oh. get to the fourth element? Given um, you have the base address. I uh, yeah, just uh, hit that plus and then four in order to see that I'm, I'm misunderstanding. So on the program, like how would you access the fourth element of an array? Anybody? You had an offset. Raymond, did you see something? It wasn't. No. Okay, Stacy. Uh, you would offset four of your uh, from your uh, index or your offset? base. Offset or well. Mm -hmm. Multiply. By multi multiply by four times. Can anybody tell me why I multiply by four? Because the, uh, the size of it is. How many? Um, 32 bits. Four bytes. Which is four bytes. And your memory is byte addressable. Right? That's why you have to multiply by four. And in the example program, how do we multiply by four? Shift, two. Shift left twice. Are we done? We got our offset. How do we get the address of the element? From your, uh, Somebody else, sorry. sorry. How do you actually get the eff effective address of the element? So you have your offset by getting the index and shifting it left twice. How do you get the effective address of the element? The membership at four parentheses, dollar sign, whatever is in four parentheses. We did that, right? No, we're talking about the, the no, 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 no. We're still talking conceptually. So we have the offset. Remember, when you want to index into the, an element in the array, you offset relative to what? To your you want your array. the base address of the array. Right. With the array, what you know are three things. Hopefully, the base of the array, the size of the elements, and how many elements you have. So if you're given the index and you want to actually calculate the address of a specific element, from the index you can get the offset, and then you add it to the base to actually find the yes vote. Sorry, this is probably a really stupid question, but what is it, what do you mean by element? So let's open the previous. Lecture. So this is an array. Right? You have a base address, and then each this is each element. Oh. And with our premise, each element is four bytes. Right? So you need four memory addresses because our memory is almost always byte addressable. I think. In, your lifetime, it will be biodiversible for most computers. So if your base is zero, to get the fourth element, which is index three, what you do is get number three, shift it left twice, effectively multiplying by four, because your elements are four byte wide. That gives you 1100, zero, zero, which is 12, which is C. Since our base is zero, I mean, you add this with zero, you get this. But if your base is not zero, this would be a different number. Okay. Does it make sense? Any question? All right. So uh, our midterm will be Wednesday, October 1. So that Monday, we, we can do a review, if you guys want. 
So I have put up a so a concept list you can get to go through. So when you before the review, before the review, you can go through this list. This is basically all that we have covered so far, six weeks. And then if there's something here that you say, what? I remember that. First, go back and see what it was you missed, and then ask questions. I don't want you to come in and say, we are go to control flow branches. Did you even try to actually try to remember what it is, right? So it's a review, not learning for the first time class. Make sense? Because otherwise, you pick one topic and we'll just spend the whole class spend a topic, which is not a good way to spend our time. Right? So make sure you go through this list and make notes of what you are not clear. Same list. Well, keep in mind that some of these are just definitions, right? Or simple thing, like why digital? Right. And not all of them may be the exam, but some of them can be pretty deep. For example, when I ask overflow, it looks so innocent. Right, just one word, overflow, just this bullet point. But if, 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 you don't, if you don't understand what overflow is, it's really hard to grasp. So it's by no way that each of this is equivalent. This the entry is, the entry is equivalent. I just list everything that I can follow that I covered. Any question? Yes, Raymond. Can you tell us what to expect on the test? What? Is it going to be 50 true false, 50 fill in the play? Well, I usually like to do. They could be true false for like warm up or definitions, so you get a feel of it. And then I usually do short answers. And the last part would be like, I'm trying to probe like what you guys are thinking about when you take a test. So it would be deep questions. So new, le new level questions. True false, like golem level questions. Would there be any like PLB CPU programming? Oh, yes. Yeah. If you have noticed here, there is. No mention of PLP assembly, because that's just a tool for us, so I can teach you these things. Right? But underlying concepts are all here, and it applies everywhere. Any question? Good question. That, to clarify, which you just asked, are you guys talking about syntax prompt yeah. uh, questions? Yeah. Okay. I will be clear if I expect a, that you know the syntax. Because sometimes I might just have a program and ask, like, what, what happens on this line? Or can you can you see what's wrong with these lines of code? Sometimes I could just ask write an algorithm. Right? That doesn't mean I have, you have to write a PLP assembly. I'll be specific if I want you to write PLP assembly. Yes. You know, the VE won't say what's wrong with this, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I guess for you, you have to be able to think through and see. Like, but usually when I make the midterm, like it's out of thousand points, but you can get you can. There are 12,000 possi 12, possible points, but I only got up to 1,000. So if, if there's one problem you just like can't get, skip it. Don't spend too much time on it. Because the idea is I want to see overall how, what do you understand. And you might want to know what you understand. That's more important. So if you get stuck on something, I don't want you to spend half of the test time and we just lost. you just lost the chance to see if you know the other the other concepts. Make sense? You can do it and we still grade it, but we are only grade up to one thousand. So we don't give bonus points in terms. Any question? Suddenly the atmosphere gets serious in this class. Why are there two midterms and no final? You want a final? No. Exactly. Another <laughs> midterm. <laughs> All right, if there's no question, we'll continue on. Yes, put up your documentation, please. Otherwise, I have no idea what you guys are doing. Yeah, this we have longer. And did you put it up just earlier? Did you get the sensor? Yeah, we've got ours up. I kind of had it. You put up at like 2.30. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, oh well, I checked this in the morning. So. And I posted it. We've had two posted. I posted I'll look at it. I don't want to accidentally post it as an issue, though. You got a web page. Maybe that's why. All right.
So we've been talking about the internals of the, of the CPU, of the computer. We've touched upon LEDs and switches and how we can use them. But if you look around you, yes, there are switches and LEDs right, in computers, but there are more devices than that. Do you agree? Switches and LEDs are not enough for everybody. <coughs> right, so that's why we, have a, we need a more general purpose way to interact outside of the computer. Can you think of something that you see every day when you use a computer that is not switches and LEDs? Mouse, mice, keyboard. How does the CPU interface with the keyboard? It's surely memory map. Mouse. How does the CPU interface with the mouse? The network, the Ethernet adapter, the internet. What does it take to go from the CPU to the internet and then display the monitor? Take your inputs and everything. There's so many things going on. But the great thing is, from your tiniest microcontroller to your desktop, the concepts are the same. Like memory map I.O. is everywhere. So if you actually go into kernel development or low-level programming, you'll see this a lot. So today is the first part of parallel and serial. So that's how we usually categorize input-output. So parallel and serial, what do you guys think about these? What's, what's parallel? Multiple lines. Multiple lines and serial? Single. Single line. So how do you think you can transmit or receive digital data this way? Parallel. How would you transmit digital data with parallel with multiple lines? Logically. Full duplex. What? Full duplex. Well, full duplex is a different concept. It's like the way right, you need right? two lines for you. It's like, how would I send a byte with a parallel interface or with serial interface? One bit per line. One bit per line with parallel. What about serial? Eight bit shots. One bit at a time. Do we see that? So in the physical layer, parallel has n little wires. It could be how many as you want for your particular system set up. But serial is one of the wire per direction if duplex, right? Parallel is simpler digital hardware because there's, well, there is notion of time. But if you want to send like one byte, you just have this eight, eight bits, send it, your data is there, out there. With serial, it's more complex because you have to time it. When you want to send one bit at a time, there's more nuance on how, you, how to do this and different ways to do it. So CPU can interact with all these different peripherals, these old time printers, one of the first few mice, webcam, even graphics card. So there are some common commonalities on how CPUs interface with all these devices. So let's say we want to transmit this data, one byte of data, BB, or 10111011. If you look at the parallel interface, you can have eight lines and set each value of the line to the bit position. And then, boom, you have your data. In serial, you have to send your bit one bit at a time. Which one do you think is faster? Parallel, why do you think so? Because there's more. More bits at a time, right? So you have more information for time quantum. But parallel I.O., when you have multiple communication lines so close to each other, some, most of the time they suffer crosstalk. That's why you can't make a really long parallel cable, because it just gets too much. If you take fields, you may learn why this is happening. So serial I.O. 
can be sped up to overcome this limitation. So that's why now, nowadays most devices are serial. When you most peripherals are serial, it's easier to make longer line with serial communication. And there are certain tricks they can do to actually make it even more robust. Does that mean that parallel communication is gone? No. Like within the CPU itself, when it talks to memory, it's still parallel bus. Because the distances are short enough that you can clock it really quickly, it still makes more sense to actually have a parallel communication line. It also makes the interface much simpler. So it can be so the serial I/O can be sped up much more than what is possible with parallel. In many situations, like I said, in some situations you still want to use parallel. Plus. So how does the CPU interface with a parallel I/O? Usually, when we have a when we have an I/O device with multiple bits, we call it a port. So it's just a collection of pins. In many CPUs, they are Group into guess how many pins per port? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Usually it's eight. So if you look at microcontrollers, they usually group it into eight bits, eight bit ports. It's convenient because if the CPU is eight bits or eight bit wide, it's easier to work with. Now when when you look at the I/O port, it's just like a memory memory address. It's like a one byte. When you write something to it. It shows up, or when you read from it, if it's an input, you get the data in like one byte format. It's really nice. So these I/O ports are usually are usually called digital I/O, DIO, or general purpose I/O, GPIO. So if you look at data sheets of record holders, you'll see these. Some analog people don't like it when it's called general purpose I/O because it's not really general purpose if it's only digital. I digress. So you can use this kind of port to drive LEDs. Devices that take bit inputs, read switches like you've been doing, or buttons. The LEDs and switches on the PLP CPUs is hardwired to two of these ports. So you just address, you use the address and you can read from the switch or output to the LEDs. And you can't do anything else with it. So they are exclusively outputs or inputs. So but the PLP CPU also has some GPIO where you can set whether each pin is input or output. How can this be useful? Having the ability in the I.O. port to set each individual bit either input or output. Can you think of a situation where it may be useful? Faster communication? Probably. Think of it in terms of devices you want to interface with. You got a lot of uh, extra memory, also. Kinda. Right. Yeah. What if you have eight-bit I/O port only, this controller, and you want to interface with four switches and four LEDs? It would be nice if you could just have set half of them inputs and half of them outputs. In modern microcontrollers, this is a given feature to be able to do this. So you can set each bit input or output or however you want. So how is this done? So usually, on a GPIO pin, you have the pin and you have the output and input latch. So the output latch will hold the bit value that you send from your processor. That's say I want to write one here. If that, if this pin is configured as an output, this buffer will be on. So whatever you write in here will be translated into IO pin, depending on what voltage you are powering the microcontroller or what it supports. For input, whatever it reads here, there's a buffer here, and we'll put that value in this latch. Everybody see that? This is one bit, this is one I.O. pin. When you have a port, you have multiple I.O. pins. And in this case, you have eight. All right, so this, so this latch has become a register. All right, so you have, uh, you have a port register. 
So if you set everything as an output, when you write FF, and all this IO pins will output high. If everything is an input, whatever you write on these eight IO lines, it will be reflected on your register, just like when you read your switches. You put any combination of switch, you load word, and you get those values as a number, as an 8-bit value. Does that make sense? So let me ask you again. So what's the difference between this and the switches or LDCs you've been using? What's special about this? This can be both. It can be both input and output. It's more flexible. Because you may get microcontroller, and you may have like 60 IO pins. You may need 14 outputs and just two inputs. All right, so it's easy, also easier in the manufacturer, so they don't have to differentiate their products. They can just have one chip, hey, you can configure your inputs. So you don't have to look for controllers that says, hey, I have 14 inputs. It's a pain. Right, so. Any questions so far? Yes? Our CPU has more pins than we need to just be able to blank. Yes. Well, optimally, when you design your product, you will get a smaller controller. So you don't have floating pins. Usually, smaller controllers will be cheaper. If you have to have pins floating, usually people uh, either, either drive it as an output or actually pull it down with the resistor because you don't want to have floating. Things. So what actually controls which direction the, the pin will act? So there's this thing called the data direction or tricep register that controls whether a pin is input or output. So that's the language, data direction or tri-state. So when you go out there and you program on controllers, you'll see these phrases. It's a really common phrase to use. Yes? Does the triangle represent the tri-state? No, the triangle is a buffer. The tri-state is this this thing. This is a tri-state buffer. What do you think is called tri-state? Three states. What are the three states? Zero, one, and? No. Floating. So on inf in input mode, that thing will be off. So you just expect it. Uh, the volume to be driven from outside. That what's make, that's what makes it an input pin. So it just doesn't drive the pin. The other terminology for tri-state in this mode is high Z, which is high impedance. It's an air, right? It's just floating. Well, it's not really air, but kind of. So when you learn about transistors, you'll see like how these things are designed. Any question? If it's input, the port data register will contain the value being read, or value being written if it's output. So mindful of the readings of the, for the pins ports. So when you're trying to drive LEDs, for example, make sure you know like how much your controller can output, can put out or sync current. And the, all, the easiest way to, to damage a controller is to drive an output pin. So if you're reading from something, make sure that pin is in input mode. It's being, being an input. So otherwise, you'll damage it. And that's one of the most common ways to damage your project in senior design. They just, it's 2 AM, they're hacking stuff together, trying to figure out like what doesn't work. Suddenly, the programmer made a mistake. Probably a bit off in the mask or wrong amounts of shift. Now some inputs are output where they should not be. Turn on the system and it doesn't work anymore. So that's the, one of the first things that you should finalize when you design these things. This things are output, this things are input. Don't mess with it. Make sense? So how do we have a bidirectional I/O GPIO on PLP CPU? Yes, we do. The PLP CPU has two times eight bit digital bi uh, bidirectional ports. The direction register is at that address, F030000. And the port A data register 
which either contains data being read or data being written, is at that address. Port B is at that address. So to actually control each pin, whether they're input or output, you write the value 0 as input and value 1 as output. This is not universal. On some controllers, this is inverted, where you set 1 to be an input and 0 to be an output. So be careful, when you, especially the ADC team. If you want to use these ports, make sure you know which direction and which value it corresponds to. Any question? Can you switch that and build it? Because it makes more sense for zero to be an output. Probably. Too late now, though. <laughs> Too late. Why, why would it be more, why would it make more sense to be zero to be output? <clears throat> you can't just throw it out. Because zero looks like an O. <laughs> OK. <laughs> nice. Moving on. O is in the word zero. I thought the same thing, too. So. <laughs> zero output. So. Maybe that's like in the pick microcontroller controller, zero is output and one's input. Maybe that's what their justification is. Or it may be like hardware doesn't make sense any other way. But on boot up, it defaults an input, which is one. On PRP CPU, it defaults zero, which is input. You want to default as input because you don't want to damage the pins, right? Yes, default, default one. Like the pick does. Maybe you should work to, yeah, with microchip after you're done. In AC, the input is considered under pressure, and the output, Which output? the neutral. In AC current, the input to whatever your resistor is, a light bulb, is considered under pressure, and then the output is considered out of pressure, as there's no amps. It's just voltage, or zero volts in amps. It's more than the other. Whoa. But that's AC, so you could follow that logic into that. AC, there is no input or output. Well, I mean, Current in, current out. Okay. Key. Power, no power, neutral. Neutrals, no. Oh, power. yes. No current. I have to actually squint at that. No way, man. <laughs> current, there's current, but going out the, the other end, the neutral. You know, there's no uh, voltage. That's where it is. Oh, neutral? Yeah. yeah. I don't care about AC anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just rectify it, clean it up, and give me 5 volts or lower. AC. DC. That's all I work with. So now people will be confused because of UGS and zero. <laughs> so in PLP CPU, on tri state, zero is input, one is output. Don't, don't break my FPGA board. All right, Mark? We're not planning on using that. What? How? I mean. Or just simulate it? Yeah. You will have to at some point, though. Do we have to in the project? Yes, you have to show the project. It works with. Yes. Well, we were planning on using the serial board. Oh, okay. Making me work. <laughs> because I have to modify it so it routes to the those pins on the side. Yeah. I thought you said you're not going to use the FPGA board. Like, how would you use it? Oh yeah, no, it's just we're writing it down. That's all. Does the ABC team know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Documented. All right. So these are the registers that you use for the GPIO, for the BIDU, BI, whatever you call it. There's endless debates on what to call it. Press me not. Support 8 bits, I think. So on the first one, the tri-state, the first byte, the least significant byte here, controls the direction of port A. The second byte here controls the direction of port B. You might ask, like, why don't you split this into two addresses? I don't know what Fritz doing. He decided to do this, do this way, I just call. Like, I mean, it's not consistent. Like, why not do the same thing like this? You know? but, but this is very common. So when you work with controllers, you'll see try the data direction register, and then you see the data register where you actually output the value or when you input the, the values. In. Any question? What is the second byte there even? It controls. What uh, for in the port B, which pins are input or output? Any other question? Okay, let's try it out.
So, let's have our editors. And so we can just have the base, the transit register, and we can use the offset and lower the store to actually access the other registers. So we don't have to save the rest. Now let's, for the first example, what should we do? Here's what we do. We have two ports, two times eight bit. You want to rep rep replicate the switches and the LEDs with this port? Why not? Sure. All right. So let's make our mask for the tri-state. So the second byte will be the direction for port B. So let's make those inputs, uh, outputs. Let's make port A inputs. Make sense? So I'm making a mask where if I if I were to write this mask into the traffic register, it will make the port A all inputs and will make the port B all outputs. If it was bad words, would be the other way around. Right? Yes. Now let me ask you, what if I do this? Yeah, one zero three sets would be consecutive one zero one zero one zero. I mean, is that <laughs> sixteen? I hope. I think it's sixteen. Oh, I missed one. Is that no, it's sixteen. So this will be the mask for the direction of port A because it's a lower byte, and this will be the mask for the direction of port B. So ones will be. Outputs and zero be inputs. I'm just going to think opposite in my head of what it should be. The midterm you'll forget. You can look up these things in the midterm. You can just have to memorize this. Zero output and then my head. So for the midterm, it's, you can check out everything except primary out. Don't <laughs> chat on your laptop, please. Zero output and input. Yeah. I'm going to ignore it. I'll head. never <laughs> forget it now. You inverse it. Just say ignore it doesn't make I'm sense. I'm going to ignore it with itself in my head. OK. Proper. So this is wrong. All right, now let's write that into the tri-state register. So what's the address? Let's see what this does. It's a wall. So this is the GPIO module. So it shows you the direction of each pin. So this is the less significant byte. This is the most significant byte. It shows you the value of the each, each pin is. So if we, if we execute these instructions, we're missing zero, guys. So now we see here, all of port B are outputs. And when the port A is input, you can actually drive it here in the simulation. So we see that? This. Now, let's do what we did with the switches and LEDs, just copy the values over. So first we want to read from port, which port is inputs? Port A. Right, so we shift by, we offset by four because look at the here, port A is at this address, this plus 4, correct? You reload the value from there, you just immediately store it back to port B, which is plus 8. 
and that's it. So now port B just echoes whatever the values in port A are. So you did the offset, but you can't just throw the address as no, because with lowered sort, you have to have the address on the register. Oh, yeah, you load the register and then use that. Yes. The four, the, 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 this immediate value is convenience. Right. Because you, have, you already have the base, it's easier to actually get the next ones. It's also a sign. You can have offset back if you want, which could be useful. Any question? I'm saying you do it by four because uh, that's input in. Output Which four is, is this? This four? Yeah, the four in the. So this is the base address of the I/O, mm -hmm. which points to the tricet register. Mm -hmm. Right. If you look at the slides again. Port A is at this address. Okay. Well, you, we already have this address saved. Uh, so you're saying load it from in, and then that SW is the out, so it's going to. Yeah. So you're loading from this address, which will get you this value, and store it here, which will be this value. Okay. What happens, do you think, if we output an input pin? Nothing. No. No. <laughs> I'll put the input pin. <coughs> so no. I hope not. I don't think. I, I hope we don't have that power. I missed something out there. You outputting to on the input. So the 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 controller is smart enough. If you have a pin as output, it won't overwrite whatever input you're reading. So it's not really nothing, because there's, there are things that can read into, but it just won't mess with the operation. So it's usually and pretty you're saying if it's set to input, and then you try to output something to it? Yes. OK. So basically what will happen is you still right to this output latch. It's my cursor. You still right to this output latch, but you just won't get translated into your IO pin. Yeah. So when it's an input pin, it only, when you go read it, it only reads from here. So if output is enabled, you're still reading all the time. right? So if you read an output pin, it just reads the current state, which is helpful because sometimes you just want to change one bit. Remember when you load everything, you mask off the rest. Well, mask, let the rest through, and just change one bit. That's not possible if you can't read what the current state of the port is. So keep that in mind. So and if you want to leave something, you just enable the output and put it back on itself. Say it again. So if you wanted to do that, just whatever you get in, kick back out. Yeah. Just enable the output. Just make sure you and you let it through with the with your mask. Like we did last week. Can you explain that one more time what your program does there, the, the last bit? Just walk through it and explain it. And with the graphic of the GPIO module as well. Okay, so basically, first you have the, ad, the base address of the IO, right? Is this clear? Yes. And you have the mask that will set the, the port A to be inputs and port B to be outputs. So this instruction, this operation, basically, you just take this value and store it into the transit register, which actually governs which pin is input or which pins are output. OK, so the first three instructions right there are your the, uh, the GPIO module, basically. And then you're telling it that you want the first eight, the top half, to be outputs and the bottom half to be inputs? Yeah. So. After the next step, I will execute a store, right? There, it changes the 
direction of this to be outputs. This window also shows you what the contents of the trash register is. So 0, 0 corresponds to this direction, and FF corresponds to this ports direction. Yes? When you individually assign bits right there, you were telling it which bits you wanted to be outputs. Yes. Want to see that? Let's do that. AA, which is 1010100. So, is F just one one? All ones. All ones? Four ones. Somebody needs to review. I've never seen this before. You did. 15. I mean, it's week two. Week one, rather. So, things like this you need to bring up on the, on the review. It's important. So what now? Now let's do a quick review. Why hex then? Why don't I just it's use binary for easier? Yes. Yeah. You compress four digits into one, right? Zero 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 to one 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 becomes zero to f. That's why us programmers, computer scientists, engineers use hexadecimal. After a while, it becomes second nature, like AA or zero and zero. What about C? One one zero zero. It's difference of two, Jason. Not second nature yet, but it will be. Yeah, if you get a conversion here, and you'll see this a lot. Even here, I have a number conversion chart, right? so you can change stuff. Next thing you know, you remember ASCII table. All right, I got it. Shoot, ask me this question. Okay, what's capital A in ASCII? Sixty-five. Nice. Okay. What's number zero in ASCII? So this is a big trick. This is my trick. You know why we use ASCII. Right? It's human readable. So we need to map some combinations of characters. Is that clear to everybody? Yes? Because next time we'll talk about about UART and we'll see ASCII a lot. Because now you have to interface with humans. I don't care. 3.14. I thought you didn't care. 1.5.2? 1.59. 559, sorry. That's about the. So how many digits were there? Five. No, five digits. 3.14159926 to. Okay. You can check it out later. Where were we? ASCII. What, what's the ASCII for numbers? You, you had two minutes. You look it up. Well, I thought we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> So the ASCII for numbers, 0, is hex 30. And then 31 is, hex 31 is 1, et cetera. It's nice, because now if you want to uh, transform the ASCII number to actual number, what do you do? Come on. Yes, Charles? No, not yet. Program. No, not yet. This has to be done. This is like programmer tricks. Why do they put it there? Again. So hex 30 is number 0 in ASCII, character 0. Hex 39 is number 9, so it's in order. So if you want, if you somebody press 8 on the terminal and gives you ASCII 8, which is hex 38, and then you want to compute it with a computer, you have to change it to the actual value, right? How do you do it from ASCII? Neo is hovering. Not shift. Totally not shift. Have. Easier than shift. Hex 30 to 0. Hex 31 to 1. Hex 32 to 2. Hex 39 to 9. Masking. Masking can, can do it. How? I'm just going to have five words. <laughs> Mask <laughs> off the top four bits. Boom, you get your number. Mm, Jennifer got it. Oh, the only one. Or you can subtract 30. Does that make sense? Charles just had a Zen moment <laughs> that we'll, he'll, he'll remember forever. You'll see this next lecture. It's actually pretty neat. It's satisfying when you like figure out the clever tricks that people did, old engineers that did it 50 years ago. OK, program. So after you have your, after you start your direction, 
See with, so I only start the bottom AA. So out in, out in, out in, out in. You see that? So one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero. Makes it harder to get confused with latency. Yep. Makes it for us when you assign the bits. Yeah, but unfortunately, on on a on a chip on an IC, it doesn't show you like this is in, this is out, this is in, this is out. It'd be hilarious if it does. Like there's a little light that says, I'm off with, I'm with. So those undergrads won't burn them. No, it won't show. So make sure you know which pins are you when you get a new design. What well, about these two instructions? What do they do? Let's switch the mask back. So much more sense. What's the load word? What's the load? What does the load word do? Loading the information from the inputs. Let's watch the register, right? So this is currently the register T0, which is empty. You haven't written to it. Not empty. Has zero. When you, when we do the load word, it'll take in this value. See there? Now T0 contains this value. Does that make sense? Because now all these pins are inputs. Because you're the four there is because you are doing because an S1 has is just the pointer to the little GPIO module. Yeah. If, if that's the pointer, and then now you're storing it at T0, the location of that pointer shifted by four? Added by four. It's an offset. Or added, right, right. But so why are you storing which I don't understand what why, why do you care about what the address is? I mean, the, the S1. We do, because this is the base address, right? Right. We want to address port A, which is this plus 4. The okay, I, I understand that, but what is, the, what is 4 bytes above that register? The tri-state. This, this register that we wrote before, that sets the direction of each pin. In here, you use zero here because we want to access that register. So that picture again. This picture. So the first store word, we actually write the direction into this address, which is the tri-state values that controls which pins are input, which, which pins are output. And if we put four on that load word, we read from this point. And the last. Operation, we put eight because we are trying to write it to this point. Make sense? You don't remember, I mean, you understand. I'm saying you can load up that exact address into a register. But he's just doing I'm optimizing it. Yeah. If I, what I can do, like uh, Jason Zero said, is this, right? Actually have the explicit address for both ports. So we can now get rid of these offsets and use those. But now we are using more registers. Does it make sense? Okay. Oh man, next lecture is going to be more, a lot more fun. You are serial communication. Because the controller has to do more for that. Here they just all right, programmer, give me the volume. Boom, output. Parallel. But serial has to actually do some timing. So in that note, I won't be here Wednesday, but I will broadcast tomorrow at 7 p.m. So if you, any of you want to join in and actually want to interact, give me your Google account, Gmail. So we can invite, I can invite you to the Hangout. Otherwise, if nobody's there, I'll just be speaking to myself. And you just watch a really short YouTube video. But if you want to be there and interact, have a microphone, we can actually do the lecture online. And Chiro will be here Thursday, and I'll be back Monday, next Monday. So send me an email tomorrow morning.
start that tomorrow, and I'll give you an invite at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. So there is no class Wednesday? No, there is no class Wednesday. You can come here, but I won't be here. The moment I figure out to set up Google Hangout here, we well, won't be coming back anymore. This <laughs> I think we can all agree that Google Hangout. What? Now they cut the engineering econ flag. With the remote? Yeah. I mean, what would be the difference? And you're doing it, you're recording it at what time? 7 p.m. For my lab. Yeah, for my super <laughs> laboratory. Wow. What time are, are you up? Plus, we can change it. 7, 7, 30 ish. He takes all the time. Yeah, he takes like three hours. What time does it finish? 7.30. We can move it back one hour. 8 p.m.? Uh, probably 8.30 would be better for me. 8.30, getting lit and later. Yeah, I think I get lit. Maybe it's 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be up. <laughs> I've had students like, we are, I want to meet at 2 a.m. Sure, you better be there. And he just backed off. Back, back off. Because I know I'll be there working on my stuff on research. I have a lab until 9 at night. Uh, 8 would be fine with me, but I just have probably joining late. Mm. That's, it's recorded too, so it doesn't really. But you will miss my interaction. Yeah, the question. Yeah, let's do eight. Eight. All right. Tomorrow at eight. It is. Send me your Google account. All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Then.